Welcome back to New Hampshire Today with Jack Heath. It's more than politics. It's where you can get informed on all the news and happenings of your day. News Radio 610 and 96.7. We are your news, traffic, and weather station. All right, welcome back to New Hampshire Today, our news time, 8 after the 8 o'clock hour. And this is a day that we were planning to have our first broadcast debate in the congressional races. This is the second congressional district of New Hampshire. And for all our election coverage, including our October 16th gubernatorial debate, which will be the first major broadcast debate in the governor's race, we thank Eastern Bank, now part of the New Hampshire banking community. J.D. Powers rating Eastern Bank tops when it comes to retail banking. Mary Linda Garcia, state representative, she's here. She'll have an opening uh, remark in a moment with John DeStaso, New Hampshire Journal, doing some of the questions. Uh, good morning, uh, Mary Linda Garcia. How are you? Good morning. I'm very well, thanks. Thank you for being here in our studios. My pleasure. And Mr. DeStaso, thank you. Thank you, Jack. I'd like to begin by reading the short letter we got from Ann Custer, Congresswoman Custer's campaign, dated September 5th. To Jennifer Wells, when we asked, we invited the uh, congressman, who I understand is in New Hampshire today, so she could have been here if they had wanted. They declined. And the letter reads, thank you for your invitation to a debate on Jack Heath Radio. That would be New Hampshire Today. On September 10th, our campaign released its confirmed schedule of debates and joint appearances with our Republican opponent. These appearances were scheduled as early as July, and we believe they will provide ample opportunity for a robust discussion of the issues on television, radio, and in person. With these four events already confirmed throughout the second district, we are not scheduling additional joint appearances with the Republican opponent between now and November 4th. Thank you again for the opportunity. Your reaction to that, Mary Linda Garcia? Well, I must confess, I keep looking over at this chair, <laughs> and Representative Custer is conspicuous in her absence. But, um, you know, I, I think during the course of my campaign as I go around the district, People really just want to be heard. They want to hear that, um, you know, their concerns, that they're able to be voiced and that their representative or those seeking to represent them are listening. You know, and sometimes it's not even more than that. They're they're pragmatic. They, you know, understand that um, results and solutions sometimes take time. You need the proper environment at times, the proper, you know, numbers of elected officials, you know, leaning one way or another. But overall, they just say we just want to be listened to. So um, I, to that effect, of course, I've invited Representative Custer to a number of uh, debates and a series of town halls. Um, she has declined to accept that invitation. And again, uh, if she's not going around, um, which she is not, just talking to people, visiting with businesses, community groups, etc., cetera, um, all over the second district, I thought it would be a good idea for us to appear jointly in various town halls mm -hmm. and forums and just let people ask us questions and voice their concerns. And then we can answer and they can decide, you know, who they think would be best to represent them. So, uh, but I guess it's a hallmark of her tenure as a rep that she hasn't hosted a town hall and now is continuing her campaign i guess just wanting to spend her million and a half dollars on negative ads john to so new hampshire journal with the questions and john just a footnote here we just had governor maggie hassan on a one-on-one -on -one interview live in new hampshire today and i asked her about some of the democrats not participating she's committed to seven of these including ours and she said she actually thinks it's an important part of the process to do these debates but i'll let that stand john Question for Representative yeah. Garcia. Uh, Representative Garcia, I'm not going to try to play the role of Ann Custer here, but uh, maybe a little bit of the devil's advocate, okay? It's just okay. To, because I think uh, I have a sense just from seeing the advertising and the mail that's been dumped. You know, I happen to live in the 2nd District, and uh, mail piece after mail piece from the New Hampshire Democratic Party keep labeling you as, and the ads, too extreme, very, you know, extreme. And the recurring phrase um, comes up Tea Party as an, in a neg negative connotation. Um, uh, I have four or five of these uh, direct mail pieces. <clears throat> they all say, quote, as Tea Party as Tea Party gets. That's the recurring phrase. What do you, what's your reaction to that? And um, is that, in your mind, a, a, a bad thing, an, an insult to you? That's what it's meant to be. It's meant to turn voters off to you, that you're, mm -hmm. as quote, as Tea Party, as Tea Party gets. Mm -hmm. What does that mean to you? Well, I think their point is, of course, to, 
use uh, negative scare tactics and labeling as much as possible. Because what we found is that, you know, it doesn't matter who the Republican candidate is, where in the spectrum they actually might be when it comes down to the election and campaign season, everyone's labels as an extremist. And, um, you know, they've been calling me an extremist since... I announced <laughs> back in January. So now they're continuing with that. And um, of course, it's hyperbolic. Um, there's, you know, contortions and, you know, distortions of what my actual positions are, etc. But I would say this, um, the Tea Party movement was an organic, really, you know, one of the most organic sort of grassroots movements that you know, occurred, I think, in a long time in the history of the country. And it was a response to a political context of the time, you know, a number of years ago. It was very peaceful. You know, they said their peace. And then there were some sort of concrete groups and advocacy groups that formulated around that. But, you know, beyond that, um, it was there for a season. And, you know, I'd be hard pressed to tell you, you know, who is Tea Party and, you know, what their, uh, you know, uh, sort of a manifesto is <laughs> right. at this point. So I guess my point here is that Democrats are using that because it was it was a group that they demonized at the time and it was effective. The media picked up on it. Popular culture picked up on it. And uh, now they're just going to try to continue to use that as a negative label. So Do people in the second district even, you know, are they mentioning that phrase? Do you hear it as you go around? I've never heard it. Mm-hmm. No. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. okay, and, interesting. Yeah, yeah. Um, the, some of these some of these issues you say they're they are um, you know perhaps taking them out of context. Mm-hmm. Uh, not one that's recurring all the time is of course on the abortion issue, mm-hmm. as I'm sure you know. And they say that you would impose criminal penalties on any person who performs an abortion on a pregnant woman under circumstances. Uh, this was, they cite a vote from 2008, House Bill 1403, which you voted against killing uh, the bill. Um, what, what's your position? I mean, is it truly that, uh, as the advertising says, that a woman who has an abortion is a criminal and a doctor who performs it is a criminal as well? Of course not. Um, if if I recall correctly, the bill they're referencing, and again distorting, was really just a way for New Hampshire to um, for New Hampshire law to be in sync with federal law, and I think that related to a ban on partial birth abortion. And what's mm-hmm. interesting about this entire debate to me is, you know, my peers, my friends, you know, women I talk to, you know, be they single, married, be they political or somewhat politically agnostic, what you find is that, again, the label pro-life or pro-choice, I think, is used as a wedge, particularly by the Democrats, who, though they pretend, you know, that they don't want to campaign on social issues it's actually all they talk about (laughs) so it's kind of interesting but you know what you find is that just because someone calls themselves pro-choice does not mean they support partial birth abortion Mm -hmm. and just because someone calls themselves pro-life does not mean they you know want to ban contraception but the democrats i think push what ought to be a reasonable discussion about you know who we are as a society what what we want to do with these laws in terms of being humane, being, um, uh, you know, in line with modern science <clears throat> and all of these things that we consider when making public policy. The vast majority, I would say about 70 percent of Americans really agree on so many issues in between mm. what are the margins of that mm-hmm. discussion. So it's too bad that we can't have a reasonable, rational discussion about um, this issue. And instead, they want to label everyone as an extremist just because they may have an opinion slightly different than follow up to John's question on that. Mary Linda Garcia, our congressional candidate, second district. Why do you think your Democratic opponent and some Democrats are using uh, the w- women's rights issue, if you will, like they have the past few elections mm-hmm. versus thing talking about jobs or, or health care or foreign policy or policies that aren't working in Washington? Mm-hmm. Why do you think they're going to that as a tactic? Mm-hmm. Tactic. It's certainly a tactic sure. in the paid advertising. Sure. Well, mm-hmm. one is because, um, frankly, I think it's insulting because they're preying upon 
what they see as, you know, a, a vulnerable group, you know, one that can be swayed with scare tactics. So I think it is a bit of an insult that they want to continually harp upon, you know, these social issue scare tactics to try to, frankly, get at people like myself, you know, 31-year-old single woman who, you know, might feel passionately one way or another about this. And um, But in reality, you know, the women I talk to... Uh, I would say, you know, maybe 2% of all of the voters I'd talk to in the, in the second district and my peers, you know, what do we talk about? We worry about the job market. We worry about our energy independence. We worry about our debt. We worry about um, entitlement reform. We worry about national security. So these are the issues that people want to talk about and women are concerned about, but the Democrats don't have a record to run on. We're going to sneak in a quick break back with John DeStaso's next question, New Hampshire Journal, John DeStaso, NHJournal.com. Mary Linda Garcia, state representative running for the second congressional district. This was to be a debate, so we're honoring the time. And Ann Custer, the incumbent congressman, was invited but declined to be here. Back in a few, New Hampshire Today. Time for the weekend TV. Tuesday brings us night two of the iHeartRadio Music Festival with even more I Can't Believe It highlights. The final night of the history making show begins Tuesday at 8 7 Central on the CW. Tuesday night also brings two new romantic comedies. Selfie stars Karen Gillan and John Cho about a social media addict who hires a self image guru to learn to live in the real world. Next up is Manhattan Love Story, which tells the story of a new couple's relationship issues. Jake McDornan and Anna Lee Tipton star, and the show's premiere Tuesday starting at 8 7 Central on ABC. Wednesday, Criminal Minds returns for season number 10, followed by the premiere of Star. Stalker, following an elite LAPD squad investigating stalking crimes. Maggie Q, Dylan McDermott, and Elizabeth Rome star, and the pair start Wednesday at 9, 8 central on CBS. Thursday night, the CW kicks off its fall season with the sixth season premiere of The Vampire Diaries, followed by the return of Rain for its second year. They're back starting Thursday at 8, 7 central on the CW. Also on Thursday, it's new sitcoms Bad Judge, starring Kate Walsh and Ryan Hansen, and the romantic comedy A to Z, starring Ben Feldman and Kristen Milioti. They kick off Thursday, starting at 9, 8 central on NBC. Based on the British show Broad Church, crime drama miniseries Grace Point, starring David Tennant and Anna Gunn, premieres Thursday at 9, 8 central on Fox. And that's your Week in TV on iHeartRadio. We are World Vision, and we believe in children. We believe in educating girls and women about immunizations, nutrition, and the healthy timing and spacing of pregnancies. If you believe, visit worldvision.org slash believe. How would you like to meet Boston Bruins captain Zidane Chara and not have to drive to the Garden to do so? Zidane Chara will be in Manchester, New Hampshire at the 4th Annual Big Z Challenge. Monday, October 20th, Herdeford Dentistry hosts this charity event at the Rivers Edge Elliott Building in Manchester. Proceeds to benefit New Hampshire's Hospital for Children. A limited amount of tickets are on sale now. Visit BigZChallenge.com for tickets. That's BigZChallenge.com for tickets and more information. Get your Halloween on for half price with Charming Fair Farm and Candia. Check out children's trick-or-treat with hay rides, costume characters, hay maze, and plenty of treats. Or dare to be scared at the Harvest of Haunts. Four attractions in one. Limited supply. Go to WGIRAM.com keyword deals now. Saturday, October 25th, the 6th Annual New Hampshire Brewfest on the grounds at Red Hook Brewery. Reserve your tickets now for the VIP session at noon, first session at 1, or second at 6 p.m. Sample from over 100 beers. Tickets available online at nhbrewfest.com. Welcome back to New Hampshire Today with Jack Heath. It's more than politics. It's where you can get informed on all the news and happenings of your day. News Radio 610 and 96.7. We are your news, traffic, and weather station. All right. We thank our friends at Eastern Bank for some of this election coverage. And, of course, we're going to have expanded election coverage all between now and November. But rejoining us now, State Representative Mary Linda Garcia, live in our studios. John DeStaso, the next question for the representative. John DeStaso, John DeStaso from the New Hampshire Journal. John. Thank you, Jack. Um, Mary Linda, I'm just going to wrap up this um, 
abortion, uh, so-called abortion issue real quick with just a two-parter. In terms of uh, understanding your, your, your views on this and that people, you are staunchly pro-life, uh, Ann Custer is uh, staunchly pro-choice. Uh, what about the, since it is the law of the land, um, is, it, is it fair, though, to prohibit the use of public funding for, for, um, for abortions so that um, since it is a legal service, that all folks are, are, can get it. And the second part is just your comments on the sort of the flare-up last week in the New Hampshire GOP regarding the so-called personhood amendment. Do you think that was – do you agree with that uh, plank in the platform? Mm-hmm. So it's just a two-part of them and move on. <laughs> sure, yeah. Well, I'll just start with the last one. My response to that was I just didn't think it was necessarily a constructive addition to the platform um, in any particular way, but naturally the uh, – Democratic <laughs> Party chose to seize on that and again try to make it you know something bigger than it is but um, <clears throat> to your first part of the question what is interesting is again they always want to twist you know any issue that frankly again I think the average American um, <clears throat> has a rational mind about and has some concerns about and that is this isn't about abortion per se it really is about taxpayer funding Mm -hmm. you know for something that at least half of the country doesn't necessarily think is something to celebrate um and uh you know you look at the organization planned parenthood and the way you'd hear democrats describe it is that you know it's this you know wonderful uh, organization providing you know so many services to underserved people i mean it has about 1.2 billion dollars in revenues planned parenthood does they have about 500 million in assistance of taxpayer uh subsidies they have they pay over 31 million dollars to have lobbyists be on capitol hill lobbying to be sure that they keep taxpayer funding and then with the passing of obamacare you know now we understand that all of that hoopla about you know an amendment uh bringing over some of the democrats that you know did have concerns about taxpayers being forced to subsidize uh this that in fact it's occurring you know uh Planned Parenthood is now receiving more subsidies to have, you know, navigators work to help people enroll, etc. So the point is they have a lot of money. Uh, They don't need it. And as a country, we need to be talking about is it okay to force people basically to take people's money and uh, despite their conscientious objection to um, this particular um, procedure and uh, and then force them to subsidize this so you know i think it's unnecessary but um the you know liberals such as ann custer they don't they don't want to hear that and in fact i've gotten a number of letters from democrats that tell tell me that you know they're a democrat they can't necessarily support me publicly but they will be voting for me because they're really concerned about the effect this will have on other charities you know religious organizations that do a lot of good work um in the community that do help just these same underserved populations that liberals will pretend only you know planned parenthood Mm -hmm. can help but you know you're they're making them basically um, betray what are their conscientious objections. So that's as organizations and that's as individuals. So these Democrats said that's why they're not going to be supporting Custer. Uh, just a quick question, sure, John, to stay so I want to work in. Um, one of our UNH uh, political experts and analysts, um, Andy Smith from the Survey Center and Dante Scala professors, said if Democrats don't do as well in New Hampshire this fall, they think the single biggest reason will be the lack of popularity of President Obama. If, if there's something, if there is a wave, mm-hmm. uh, how would you, Mary Linda Garcia, uh, characterize the Obama presidency to this point? Um, successful, moderately successful, or failure? I think you have to look at um, different aspects. I mean, there's the economy, there's the transformation, you know, of our country and particular areas such as, you know, healthcare, one sixth of our economy, there's foreign policy. And so, for example, right now, I think we are taking um, 
what are you know is the best course of action um, in Iraq and Syria and you know with ISIS but I think weakness in foreign policy and you know um, not having clarity of purpose in who we are as a country you know coming directly from our leader our our president is what led to this you know and making decisions for political reasons such as again withdrawing all of the troops you know even though that led to this destabilization um, so I, I mean it's I would say it definitely has not been a successful uh, presidency and um, I think to your point the American people really feel that. And so when it comes to how does the president's record and the president's popularity affect these other federal races, well, one of it is just the general sentiment out there. But the other is when you look at some of these specific elected officials, such as Representative Custer, she was his biggest champion. You know, she still claims to be one of his strongest supporters in all of U.S. Congress. She votes with you know, the president, she says, over, you know, 94 percent of the time. Um, she, when I talk to business owners and different people um, in the state, one of their concerns is that they express, you know, their opinion or concern about a particular bill. And the response, if they get a response from Representative Custer, she say, says, well, I know this is really important to the Obama administration, so I'm going to have to support it. Things like that. So, you know, I, I think it's all cumulative overall. You know, it has not been a success. People are angry about, you know, being lied to when it comes to you could keep your plan, you could keep your doctor, all of that. They're concerned about the lethargic, you know, economy. Okay. Uh, and, and you know, uh, there are just a lot of uh, the, frankly, scandals too. you know, the IRS, the uh, aftermath of Benghazi, etc. So the big issue here is um, as a referendum on the president, how closely has whatever federal elected official, you know, is in question in this case, Custer, supported um, just blank, blankly uh, the president's agenda and not stood up for the people of New Hampshire. When we come back, John DeSaiso, next question for Marilyn de Garcia. It's our congressional, uh, second district congressional conversation with a candidate back in a few, New Hampshire today. New Hampshire's traffic and weather together. It is 8.30, traveling northbound on 93. We have an accident by exit 22. The left lane is blocked. Traveling southbound, usual delays from Concord to the Hooks and Tolls and into Manchester. South of the city, we have heavy volume that continues to the border, crossing over usual delays in and around the Boston area, especially around 495 southbound, where we have stop-and-go traffic between exits 45 and 40. Back here in New Hampshire, out on the seacoast, Spalding Turnpike southbound, you've got stop-and-go traffic between the Route 4 merge and the Sullivan Bridge. Heading eastbound on Route 4, it's stop-and-go between routes 108 and 16. Everett Turnpike southbound, heavy volume between the tolls and exit 12. Spot a problem? Give us a call, 866-999-7200. From the Portsmouth International Airport weather desk, here's Kevin Scarupa. Looks like we'll have a lot of lingering clouds out there today and some patchy drizzle from time to time. But overall, a much cooler afternoon than what we've had over the last three or four days. We'll look for high temperatures in the lower half of the 60s with a light breeze out of the northeast. Tonight, patchy fog forming, maybe a widely scattered shower and a low in the lower 50s. For tomorrow, we're back into the lower half of the 60s. A couple of passing showers are a possibility. Clouds will break a bit for Thursday and Friday with highs in the mid to upper 60s and then a round of rain a possibility on Saturday. From the Store Watch 9 Weather Center, I'm meteorologist Kevin Scarupa. It's currently 57 degrees in Manchester, 55 in Concord, and 54 in Portsmouth. New Hampshire Today, brought to you by Auto Fair on News Radio 610 and 96.7. Raising kids can be tough these days. As a parent, you've got your hands full making sure your kids have what they need to stay healthy and get the care they need when they're sick. Well, now there's help. Medicaid and the Children's Health Insurance Program offer free or low-cost health insurance for kids and teens all the way up to age 19. They can get regular checkups, immunizations, doctor and dentist visits, hospital care, mental health services, prescriptions, and more. Children in a family of four earning up to $47,700 a year or more may qualify. And parents may be eligible for Medicaid, too. It's a helping hand for parents with their hands full. For more information, go online to insurekidsnow.gov or call 1-877-KIDS-NOW. That's 1-877-543-7669. 
Enrollment is open year-round, but why wait? A message from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Imagine working hard for so many years and reaching your retirement only to find out there's an issue with your pension or 401k. Unfortunately, it's a problem too many Americans face. The New England Pension Assistance Project can help you get the benefits you've earned. Funded by the U.S. Administration on Aging, the New England Pension Assistance Project has a proven track record of success in obtaining benefits for its clients. From challenging pension denials and miscalculations to helping with the division of retirement assets in divorce and tracking down retirement benefits from past employers, the New England Pension Assistance Project has recovered more than $42 million in retirement benefits for its clients by providing them with free legal help. Contact the New England Pension Assistance Project at 888-425-6067. That's 888-425-6067 or visit them online at pensionhelp.org slash New England. A public service message from the U.S. Administration on Aging's Pension Counseling and Information Program. Hi, I'm Jack Heath. Join me for New Hampshire Today weekdays from 6 to 9 on New Hampshire's News Radio 610 and 96.7. Welcome back to the show. You're listening to Mark Hebert's Money Sense. I'm Mark Hebert, president of the Harbor Group in Bedford, New Hampshire. We've been helping folks with their wealth management for 33 years. We've got Dave on the line. Hey, Dave, how can we help you today? Hi, Mark. A little confused. I'm hoping you can help. I don't want to put all my money in the stock market with hitting all-time highs, seeing I'm close to retirement. But on the other hand, I'm afraid of losing money in the bond market if interest rates go up. What should I do? Visit harborgroup.com. Dream. Define your life. Let the Harbor Group help make it happen. This report is brought to you by Belvita Soft Baked Breakfast Biscuits. Crunchy Belvita are delicious biscuits that are carefully baked to release steady energy all morning long. Share what you use steady energy for your morning win with hashtag morning win. Now back to New Hampshire Today with Jack Heath, where the talk is all about New Hampshire. We are your news, traffic, and weather station. We are back. New Hampshire today. This is a special hour-long discussion with one of the con- conversation with one of the congressional candidates. She is Mary Linda Garcia, state representative running in the 2nd District. And again, we just, in fairness, uh, Ann Custer was invited to be here, the incumbent congresswoman, and she declined. John DeStace of New Hampshire Journal. Talking during the break, we'll go to your question next. Learning that Mary Linda Garcia is an accomplished harp player professional musician as well but we'll get back to that maybe yeah I uh, but you're yeah it's interesting your your next question for the representative right representative you had you had brought up uh touched on foreign policy so let's let's go to that and uh it also kind of plays into the um the politics of 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 uh, being with obama or against them there was a, a vote just a, recently in the house 273 to 156 to uh train and arm so-called moderate Syrian rebels, and there was but it was one of those votes where there was kind of bipartisanship and party splits on both sides, and that happened in our own delegation. Representative Custer voted in favor of this proposal by the president, and Representative Shea Porter, who was also a supporter of the president, opposed it. Um, what, where do you come down on that uh, vote? How would, do you think you would have voted if you were there? <clears throat> yeah, I I was considering that, and I think it is an extremely difficult uh, vote. And, you know, granted, I would hope (laughs) members of Congress have, you know, better information about what the situation is on the ground and, you know, military experts, etc. Whereas I do legitimately just read about it in the news like everybody else. But I would say the concern is this. On the one hand, there's no question, you know, ISIS needs to be stopped. Action needs to be taken. Military experts have said, you know, airstrikes aren't necessarily enough, but sure, you know, they're effective, but we need that ground support. So where does the ground support come from? The president is saying absolutely no troops on the ground, which I understand the sentiment behind that. You know, none of us want to have troops on the ground, but I have a concern with the president basically telling, you know, the enemy or telegraphing exactly how far, you know, we're not willing to go. And Mm -hmm. I think we talked about this last time, Um, you know, to protect the national security of our country. And again, you know, uh, accept, you know, responsibility for what's occurring in some respects. Um, The other issue is 
Okay, so that means that the people on the ground, you know, the Syrian, you know, citizens, the Iraqi citizens, they need to be masters of their own destiny and engage, you know, and, uh, you know, put put their energy and, you know, lives on the table to try to fight back uh, ISIS. So then they say, well, you know, they can't do that without support from us, hence a bill to train and, you know, fund and give them arms. Well, the problem with that, I, you know, I have some concerns because we've seen this happen before, you mm -hmm. know. In sure. other words, who really are the rebels? You know, are they really our friends? You know, are they are they on our side right now, but then will be opposing us, you know, in the future and using our arms against, you know, either us or our other allies? Um, look at, or will they just be overrun by the enemy as such as occurred with in Iraq? You know, ISIS took over uh, the uh, Iraqi <clears throat> um, army and is again now using our weapons against them and against uh, the, the Kurds and mm -hmm. um and against us. So I think it's a real challenge. I would have to say that I hesitantly would have voted in either direction. Um, and yeah. I, I, you know, with all the best information I could have, I, you know, I would have made a decision and would have had an explanation for you. But as of now, both routes concern me a bit for mm -hmm. those reasons. What do, you, what do you think of the U.S. now negotiating with Iran? as a way to help fight ISIS. Uh, That's a concern as well. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, again, you know, you look at it's sort of a strange, uh, th as they say, you know, politics make strange bedfellows. Well, obviously, conflicts uh, in that region also do. Yeah. You know, you look at our our partners right now on the Gulf, which uh, their issue is that they want to oppose the Syrian government, and they're taking our um, sort of collaboration with them, and you know, on the ground in Syria to sort of trumpet that look you know the u.s is working with us and then you have our leaders saying no actually we're not we're being you know just neutral and just trying to you know be effective with you know the situation with isis right now so that's concerning then sure with iran um you know you know the relationship with russia and you know how they're being aggressive and pushing the envelope and then frankly iran was a big issue you know, a number of months ago before ISIS, you know, sort of came to the fore. And I think they've sort of been enjoying the lack of scrutiny and, um, you know, the, the past they've been getting re uh, recently. And I think this puts them in a, you know, stronger position going forward than they necessarily should be in. Just a quick follow up on John's question about ISIS and the strategy, John, of Marilyn Garcia. The White House and the president saying going into the weekend, and at least one major intelligence official, Mr. Clapper, saying we underestimated the threat of ISIS in Syria, that they had exploited the civil war and they were more serious and advanced than we knew. Do you think we have underestimated the domestic threat of Americans who might have left this country, trained with ISIS and come back right now over the next few months in this country in major cities where they could strike? Do you think we have enough information if you were elected – member of congress do you think our homeland security folks and the intelligence people are being frank with the american people that there are more of these isis domestic grown terrorists here or not well there's no way to really know that of course but uh, what we do know is that over 500 american and european i think it's maybe even in the thousands now um <clears throat> you know uh, have U.S. or European passports and have gone to join ISIS. So certainly that's very concerning. Um, and then, you know, again, we talked about this a lot in the primary and how secure is our country? Uh, sure, if they're just coming in by airliner, maybe, you know, we have a way to flag <clears throat> um, their passports and, you know, be cautious of that. But what about our borders? You know, are they secure? Could they, you know, come back that way? And uh, so uh, there are a lot of concerns. And when it comes to, you know, the intelligence community and the president, you know, actually, the intelligence community has been talking about this and briefing the president on it, they said, for a while now, which uh, brings us back to, you know, last November when the president just sort of, you know, brushed them off as a JV team and, mm -hmm. you know, all of that. And the intelligence community at that point said, look, no, we we actually know they're a big threat. So now I guess the issue is that it's even a larger threat. We'll which move is on to Scott, I was just going to say Scott Brown, the Senate candidate, of course, wants to and has proposed back when he was in the Senate for Massachusetts, uh, stripping 
Americans who fight alongside ISIS of their citizenship. Um, and while that may sound good, uh, a lot of people think there are constitutional issues involved here. And I know that you're, you know, uh, as a conservative, you may have constitutional mm-hmm. questions about that, whether this is something that is uh, a, you know, a good thing to do or whether folks like this should be brought back and put through the put through due process under the Constitution of the United States. Any any thoughts when you heard that proposal? Yes, I think, uh, you know, emotionally and sentimentally, we all, you know, agree with the concept there, which is that, look, if someone's going to go join ISIS Mm -hmm. and fight against us and, you know, commit murder and mayhem, you know, to innocent people, um, obviously, uh, we were not exactly sympathetic to them at all or their cause. And uh, they've basically, you know, renounced their citizenship in some respects. But sure, when it comes to is this an appropriate course of action, is it constitutional, uh, etc., I think the concern is that how far does it extend? In other words, what about people that maybe went to Syria, you know, and we read about it through social media or we found out, you know, through YouTube or something, maybe... Uh, suddenly are we going to be in a situation where american citizens that communicated you know with someone that is an isis or you know maybe was thinking about it you know family I, you know where does it stop you know and again does the government have that right so you know if we're talking something as basic as this is an isis fighter who came from america and is on youtube you know participating in you know beheading an american citizen that's clear cut but it seems to me that in reality things aren't always that clear cut. So maybe we should just be sure that we know who has left this country to join ISIS and then not perhaps allow them back here. Right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, I, about, you know, stripping their citizenship. I, I I would like to study that issue more. Okay, we're going to sneak in a quick break. We'll come back and with more questions. Mary Linda Garcia, second congressional district Republican candidate, John DeStaso, NA Journal. Check out his stuff, NAJournal.com. Back in a few. Hi, I'd like to apply for a student loan. Wonderful. We just need to verify that you've registered with Selective Service. But I haven't registered. Oh. Hi, I'd like to sign up for a job training program. Fantastic. This program is great for learning the skills that help you get a good job. Let's just check to make sure you've registered with Selective Service. Well, I haven't registered. Oh. Thank you for letting me interview for this government job. I'm really excited about working here. Well, yes, but your records indicate that you're not registered with Selective Service. I'm sorry. Young men who fail to register with Selective Service can find a lot of doors closed to them. The law requires that all men register with Selective Service within 30 days of their 18th birthday. If you don't, you lose your right to receive student loans and job training, and you're shut out of federal employment. Don't close the doors to your future. Register with Selective Service online at www.sss.gov or at your post office. Hey, Manchester, Dave Ramsey here. Are you missing teeth or are you tired of dealing with denture problems? Well, if you are, it's time to do something about it. Call Dr. Russell Mann at Mann Family Dental today. With all the advancements available in dental implants, Dr. Mann can offer his patients this life-changing alternative to old-fashioned uncomfortable and sometimes embarrassing dentures. You can improve your health and quality of life with dental implants. You'll also be able to chew better, you'll have clearer speech, and your teeth will have a more natural look. To learn more about dental implants, call Man Family Dental today. Start eating the foods you love and living the life you deserve. Call Dr. Russell Mann at 603 603- Four one three zero three seven six for a complimentary appointment. That's six zero three four one three zero three seven six or at manfamilydental dot com. And be sure and tell them Dave Ramsey sent you. This report is brought to you by Choice Hotels. What's the secret to great business trips? Choice Hotels. Because now, when you take two separate trips, you can earn one night free. Stay for business at Choice Hotels and visit choicehotels.com for details. Great endings begin here. New Hampshire's traffic and weather together. 847 traveling southbound on 93. Slow traffic between exits 3 and 2. Those slowdowns continue to the border, crossing over 
Usual delays in and around the Boston area. If you're heading northbound on 93, we have an accident by exit 22. The left lane is blocked. Out on the seacoast, Route 1 southbound, you've got slow traffic in Portsmouth. We also have slow traffic on the Spalding Turnpike heading southbound between 95 and the traffic circle 95. Usual delays on either side. If you spot a problem, give us a call, 866-999-7200. The FBI ensures it preserves the integrity of its investigative, financial, and administrative programs through its inspection division. The standard that we hold ourselves to should be unimpeachable. The FBI has self-imposed policy and guidelines for conducting investigations and operations, all while protecting civil rights. The internal policies and guidelines often hold us to a stricter standard than what the Department of Justice mandates by law. The inspection division makes sure the FBI works within all of the set parameters in a transparent, fair, and impartial process. Section Chief Tracy Page says holding ourselves accountable is who we are as an organization. Every FBI employee takes an oath to uphold and defend the Constitution, and we take that seriously, and we want to ensure that all our employees continue to do so, so we maintain the integrity we have had through the last hundred years. From FBI headquarters, I'm Molly Halpern on News Radio 610 and 96.7. Imagine working hard for so many years and reaching your retirement only to find out there's an issue with your pension or 401k. Unfortunately, it's a problem too many Americans face. The New England Pension Assistance Project can help you get the benefits you've earned by providing free legal help. Contact the New England Pension Assistance Project at 888-425-6067 or visit them online at pensionhelp.org slash New England. A public service from the U.S. Administration on Aging's Pension Counseling and Information Program. UNH football fans, have we got a deal for you. Purchase four tickets to any UNH football home game for only $44. The only way to get this deal is to log on to WGIRAM.com. Tickets subject to availability while supplies last. Viva Match Vegas Deals has discounted VIP passes to Spooky World Presents Nightmare New England. For a limited time, get a VIP pass to Nightmare New England for $40. That's a $20 savings. Skip the lines as a VIP and save money doing it. WGIRAM.com. Keyword deals. Welcome back to New Hampshire Today with Jack Heath. It's more than politics. It's where you can get informed on all the news and happenings of your day. News Radio 610 and 96.7. We are your news traffic and weather station. We are back. Representative, State Representative Mary Linda Garcia is here in our studios as part of our discussion with the candidates or a conversation this morning. John DeStace, we'll come back in a second with John So for some final questions. Uh, let me ask you this. Um, as a candidate, personally, what has surprised you uh, in this process? What has pleased you? What has disappointed you of just getting out there and sure. running for such a major office? Um, I, I would say what has pleased me is, of course, you know, when you're just working on one task after the next, you know, and running around, visiting people, doing interviews, etc., you never really know how much you're saturating. You know, do do people know who I am, you know, my name, what my message is, are they, you know, supportive, etc., am I communicating well? So what's been pleasing is just, you know, obviously the demonstration of support that you know, the primary uh, made clear. So that was amazing. And then I would say just, you know, the letters I get, the emails, you know, supportive Facebook posts, all of these things from, you know, a lot of people I've never met, you know, some that I've met once um, that just are very encouraging. And so that's been wonderful. Um, I would say what's disappointing and difficult is, um, you know, I came into this wanting to be authentic, wanting to talk about you know, what I'm seeking to accomplish, what my values are, et cetera. And you want to really uh, keep your own tone and, you know, be positive and, you know, talk about what you want to talk about. And when it comes to the 24-7 media cycle um, and all of the content you have to generate and then all of that you have to respond to, a lot of it being these, you know, baseless hyperbolic attacks, uh, what's disappointing is that you do end up just having to check boxes in some respect, you know, do another press release, respond to this ad. And it it does distract you from what 
what you know the point of why you got into it which is you know to talk about wanting to limit the size and scope of government you know put decision making power back in the hands of you know new hampshire citizens and individuals and the community so thank i would you. say that's what's disappointing. thank you john <laughs> yeah um a major issue domestically uh certainly in new hampshire but is is um gun violence i mean we've all seen the the video from um, Ferguson, Missouri, and f- Chicago, and throughout the country. I know you're staunchly pro Second Amendment. Uh, I talked about mail before. I got mail in my box from the NRA supporting you. Um, uh, do, do you believe do, what? Do you believe there is an inordinate amount of gun violence in this country uh, as compared to years gone by? And uh, last year, for instance, uh, Senator Ayotte oppose the amendment mentioned to me which would require background checks for sales at gun shows and over the internet uh, how do you feel about about that particular proposal and how do you feel in general about how congress if it should have a role in, in addressing all this violence that we see uh, in the throughout the country sure i think it's a multifaceted issue um for me the underlying principle here is that look uh, the the Second Amendment is clearly, you know, enshrined as a right, you know, for all Americans in our foundational documents. So we have to remember that. <clears throat> and then a lot of things are going on in society. Um, and sadly, yes, some of it has resulted in gun violence. Um, one thing to look at, though, is, is it just there's more coverage you know, of such episodes? And then does that coverage, you know, media coverage then result in copycat episodes that might not have occurred before that? Then looking at what's causing that, is it really access to firearms or is it, you know, mental illness? Is it loneliness? Is it sort of the disintegration of our societal fabric and, you know, troubled youth and, you know, all, all of these social, you know, societal issues. <laughs> then when it comes to politics and policy, I think we tend to be very reactionary um, as elected officials and particularly, you know, those on the left. So look at Representative Custer for an, as an example. After the um, tragedy in California, I believe it was, she basically said, I want to ban, uh, you know, assault weapons, she said, uh, because of this episode. Or then she clarified, I mean, military assault weapons, military style assault weapons. And then people said, well, the shooter in that instance used handguns. So how would that have prevented, you know, this? So can you clarify what it is you want to ban and why? And basically her response was just, I want to ban guns is what it came down to because there was actually no connection between what she was trying to capitalize on politically, which is again, ride this, you know, wave of, oh, you know, firearms are dangerous uh, because of that particular um, episode. So, I think that's what the problem is. And when I talk to uh, citizens, you know, that are law abiding, that, you know, may like to hunt, you know, that are firearms dealers, whatever the case may be, they're very conscientious of safety. Um, They, you know, aren't breaking the law at all. And they find that representatives like Custer are just always looking for ways to infringe upon what are their Second Amendment rights and aren't actually doing anything positive to stem gun violence. We just have a few moments left, John, if you have a quick question, and maybe we'll allow uh, Mary Linda Garcia to wrap it up. Or- sure, just a quick one. This is um, political, I'm sorry, but um, I couldn't help but notice that the speaker, John Boehner, was in town last week uh, to endorse you and, and raise funds for your campaign. And um, uh, I know you say that you're an independent uh, person and would be in Congress. Um, your feelings uh, since he was in here um, trying to get you elected, how, the job he's doing. And uh, next January, um, did you tell him that you'd support him? Well, he never did ask. If, if, the, if he remains Speaker <laughs> but, and if, if, you, if the House remains Republican. Sure. So what's interesting is I think when I first <laughs> announced back in January, a number of members of the press, you know, their question, are you, are you more Ted Cruz? Are you more John right. Boehner? You know, and again, they want to put you in a box, mm-hmm. you know, and kind of have everyone associate you with, you know, 
someone that they either like or despise, basically. I mean, that's concerning because I've always said, look, how about listen to what I have to say? You know, I'm not either of those people. Obviously, we all are, you know, Republican candidates, Republican officials. So why not focus on the fact that at the end of the day, we're all on the same team? We may have different ways of, you know, looking to accomplish <clears throat> but uh, certain things, but at the end of the day, we you know, agree on a lot. So anyway, fast forward. Now, here I am. I've had, you know, Ted Cruz come to support me. I've had John Boehner come to support me. Look, I appreciate both of them. Um, and I, again, am just seeking to represent the second district and, uh, you know, respond to their concerns so about no health care, education. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, um, you know, Th okay. that, that's what I'm about. Well, I want to thank uh, Representative Garcia. Thank you very much for being here. Appreciate the time. Look forward to getting you back again uh, on, on some smaller segments as well as your opponent and Custer's welcome here before now in November. Thank you for joining us in what would have been a debate, but it ended up being a conversation, not because of your campaign, but thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it, both of you. And John DeStesa, as always, one of the very, very best here in the Granite State. Thank you. NHJournal.com. John, thank you very much. Hope Thanks, to get Jack. you back in again soon for more of these and uh, maybe a debate. You never know. <laughs> you never know. All right. Tomorrow, join us. We'll